Mims, I'm going to go out on a limb and call Mims a Julio Jones ceiling. He has the body type. He's got the catch radius and uh, not this, not this game, but the last week's game against Miami when he got that offensive pass interference call from mugging the defender. <laughs> I'm 100% okay with that. I would rather take that 10 yard penalty and have my number two receiver putting it in the brain of those defenders that he's not going to play around with them. I'll take that 10 yards Amen. and he's just, he's showing that he's here to play. So that's, he's going to be big time. He's going to be really big time, but I think that's off the top of my head. That's all I got right now, man. Me, be, <clears throat> me being a receiver, honestly, that offensive pass in the first call, wasn't an offensive pass in the first call. <laughs> I, I think it was drawn. It was pushing a line, but yeah, I, I would I would agree. But. When you leave your feet to go up and you're actually looking for the ball, yeah. whether you're on top of the DB or not, when a DB's mm-hmm. not, that's not pass interference. Yeah. Um, and that's all he did. He basically left his feet to go up for the ball. I mean, he left his feet a little early, and he was riding the DB's back, but the DB never looked at <laughs> the ball, and he was. And you have the, the the rule is you have the opportunity to go up for the ball, no matter where it is. <clears throat> the DB does as well, but the DB never looked back. He just happened to actually jump on the DB's back going up for the ball. I, right. I, I would, as a referee, that's a bad call to me. Um, this is just my opinion because he, he didn't make any other egregious efforts to get the DB out of the way. He didn't push off. He didn't do anything. He just jumped. Just so happened that he jumped on the DB's back. He wasn't looking. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, it's just a bad thing. But, you know, to, to, to go back to what I said about Mims, he's going to be very good in this league for a while. His, his, his biggest thing that he needs to work on this, this offseason is getting off press coverage. And once he learns to do that and get a little separation, um, he is going to be really good. I wouldn't say as much as, like you said, Julio Jones ceiling. I wouldn't go that far. Um, Julio is in the class by himself. That, 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 dude, is, <laughs> that dude is just up there. Um, and he's learned, and he learned early – one of the things he 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 had the the wealth to work with Roddy White as a as his as his mentor and as a as a an older receiver to learn some things from. Not to say that Julio would have needed it because Julio is just that special type of receiver. Um, mm-hmm. But when you're in, when you're in a situation as a rookie, a first year player, to learn from a vet who actually was a Pro Bowler, it helps you out a lot. Yeah. Um, it's just that Mims doesn't have that, but. He does have some coaching uh, there for him, um, and don't get me wrong; he can learn from Perryman. He can learn from Crowder because Crowder knows those 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 nuances of getting off press coverage, of of working uh, routes in between, um, and working to get separation on a deep route, uh, mm-hmm. how to play the ball on a deep route. So um, it's just for him. And and again, uh, next year if Perryman is here. Those guys are going to be good. We got to remember that a couple of guys actually opted out. Um, yeah. You know, they had uh, Dotson, who was actually supposed to be uh, one of the guys uh, pressing for for a starting position, and he was a he's a former first rounder. He was looking for a fresh start. So, um, you know, we'll we'll see if if they can grab one of the top guys in free agency, and if they do, that's just going to make you know the the skill position a lot better. Um, and we saw today that if those those young guys can get a chance to carry the ball and they run behind Beckton. Those guys are going to be very good, um, and 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 Ty, actually with his with his time in, in in Detroit, he has some some experience behind him. And yeah, I said this from the from the first time he carried the ball in in, in Miami. He needs to carry the ball a lot more, um, and he showed that he can get to the outside. He shows that he has the poise to 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 run inside, um, and he had 100 yards today, 100 yards in touchdown mm-hmm. uh, against a good team, and did it mostly under pressure because there wasn't really a whole lot of passing going on for, for the Jets today. And they, they the Raiders knew they were going to be running the ball and they, and they still got it done. So, um, you know, from, from, from here on out, the Jets end up with that first pick and they do take Trevor Lawrence. He's going to have an abundance of, uh, of talent around him to, to, to help him out going forward. Yeah. Rob, I got to ask you a question as a, as a former wide receiver, take me through, what it's like when you guys are prepping for a game, like the meetings, are you guys studying film? Are you studying tendencies? You know, kind of give us a look behind the curtain a little bit. I mean, obviously you've, you've, you've been there. You've, you've gotten to play with uh, play against some of the greatest DBs and some of the greatest wide receivers that have ever played the game. So, you know, you, you probably have so many stories to tell us. <laughs> well, it was a little different when I was playing, you know, you get the, 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 the defenders could actually do a lot more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember that. That was uh, that was the bump uh, uh, bump and grind days. 
yeah, you could you could you could ride a receiver down the field the whole the the, the whole time as long as the ball wasn't in the air, it wasn't pass interference, it wasn't holding, it wasn't anything like that. So um, it was a little different back in those days. But what what you would do is basically you, w- once the game plan came out and you saw who you're going to be playing against, you basically knew where the 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 other team was going to line up. So uh, you know if you were going to be followed from from side to side by by a certain DB, or if you know if they played um, what side they played and basically the coverages that they played most of the time. And then you would take their tendencies, what they did uh, well and what they didn't do well. Um, and you try to work on that for the most part during the week in your individual game. Um, so if, uh, for instance, um, you know, when, when, when I was in, in New York, we, we played against the, the Patriots and one of their best uh, DBs was Maurice Hurst. We knew he was good. He was a quick guy. He, was a, he wasn't a very big guy. He wasn't very strong, but he was quick. Um, and he had very good hands. So you knew you had to work <clears throat> on your on your on your breaks because he would be right there in your hip pocket. Um, you know, when I was in Philly, I played against Dion twice. Dion was a guy who pressured you a lot, um, and he he went for the ball. He wasn't a guy that actually the the, the guys back in, in my day didn't play DB like the guys do nowadays. They played the ball, so those guys were looking for interceptions. They weren't trying to just break passes up. Um, so it was a little different. You had a lot of hand fighting that you had to go on. So push pushing off. It was kind of was kind of okay back then um, because DBs pushed and as as offensive guys we pushed off as well um, and it was warranted man because you know DB would would grab you ten yards down the field they're holding and it wasn't called so you had to get their hands off you um, and you worked on that all week long so if you knew a guy had tendencies to hold you would work on that all week but in the, in in your meetings throughout the day um, and throughout the week once the game plan was installed uh, every day is a different situation so. Uh, for us, Wednesdays was, was basically run type situations. You had play action passes that would go into the offensive game plan all throughout Wednesday's practice and Wednesday's film meeting. Um, Thursday was, a, was the whole passing game. So you went through the whole passing game of what, what was going to be in the game plan for that week um, in every situation, whether it was first and 10 play action, first and 10 pass, second and long, second and short, uh, third down passes, whatever it was, whatever situation you could possibly think of that's going to come up in a game. You went over it that day in, in, in practice. Um, but you also had your individual work where you went against uh, DBs in, in, in one-on-ones. And during the season, you still did that. So, um, you know, the teams that I played on, we had good DBs, that, uh, thankfully, um, on the teams that I played on. Um, you had to go against those guys every day in, in, in practice. One-on-ones, it just made you better, made them better. Um, Fridays wasn't really a, a huge long day. Fridays was basically no pads. Uh, you walk through a lot of stuff, make sure you had the game plan down correct. Um, mostly every team did the, did the thing. And we see it where Gates actually is very good in his first series. Um, and every team has a first series script of the plays, uh, 10 plays that you script out. That's going to be the first 10 plays of the game. And you went over those 10 plays um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So everybody had it down. So you knew what it was, was going to be, no matter what situation came up, the first 10 plays is going to be the first 10 plays, no matter what. Um, so you know what it is. It's just after that, if you have a good offensive coordinator, they're going to, you know, adjust to how the game is being played out. But for the most part, you knew what the defense was going to give you. Um, and you know what you had to go against. Um, and, and it was a little more, uh, I don't want to call it vanilla, but the teams, the best teams back when I was playing, played their regular defense. They didn't switch up a whole lot. You know, if they played cover two, they played cover two. That was it. You just had to beat it. Um, and if there was a team that, that played a lot of man-to-man, they, they played man-to-man. You just had to beat it. They didn't really throw a lot of junk defenses in. You knew when they were going to blitz. Um, if it was third and long, they might they might bring the heat on you. If it was second and long, they would bring the heat. Um, but, you know, regular regular down and, and distance situations, it just was what it was. You just had to play it out. and You you had to beat them. Those That's what you had to do to the best teams back then. Cowboys, the Eagles. Uh, the Patriots, when, when they came along, the Patriots used to do that. They didn't really do a lot of blitzing. They just played what they played. Um, Tampa, you know, when they had the, the Tampa two, um, and it just wasn't what it was. You knew they were playing the cover two. You knew they weren't going to bring a lot of pressure. They used their front four to bring pressure, and that was it. <clears throat> um, b- back when I was playing, it was the Broncos did that, but that as well. But the Broncos were the one team that would throw some junk defenses in and bring some, some fluky blitzes every once in a while. And you just had to prepare for it. You knew it was going to come every, you know, every once in a while, but you just had to prepare for it. But, you know, it's just a little different now. Um, they don't practice as much. They don't practice in pads as much. 
there's a lot more meetings for these guys now um, with the new rules, CBA rules. Um, and I'm not just talking about this year because of the COVID situation. It's just the CBA rules don't don't make them uh, don't allow them to practice in pads as much uh, from training camp all through the season. Um, you know, training camp for for myself was six to eight weeks. Now it's not even close. And it was pads. It was double sessions for six weeks. You know, it was rough. <laughs> yeah, it was heat. It was in the heat of the summer. You know what I mean? So it's just a little different, but. For the most part, the meetings and everything is still the same. Those guys have their game plans in. They go on Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. They're going over the game plan, uh, whatever the situations might be. And mostly every team scripts their first 10 to 15 plays. That's why you see uh, a lot of offenses actually go down the field right away on their first first uh, uh, series, and they score because they, they've worked on that every day uh, of practice for that week. You know what, you, you you actually are making great points, Rob, and I'm, I'm thankful for your insight on the show tonight. Uh, you teased a little bit about one of the questions that I wanted to ask about the DBs in particular. You know, we've got a lot of young guys um, on the team currently, guys who are, you know, undrafted free agents uh, as well as rookies uh, specifically. Um, but I wanted to ask about your experience with the corners on this team back in the day. Like, uh, as far as who it is that you faced when you were in the green and white, who are some of the toughest corners that were on the team uh, when you played and, and, and who were your, you know, who were the toughest matchups that you had in practice uh, on, on a daily basis? Um, probably the toughest guy I went against every day in practice was James Hasty. Um, cause, cause wow. James Hasty was, was a, a big, strong DB. Um, One of my favorites. He was, James was physical. He, he liked to get up in your face. He didn't like to play off coverage. Um, so, um, he was a guy that, 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 that pressured you a lot. Um, and he, he would hold you. He would, he would beat you up at the, at the line of scrimmage if he could. Um, so it just it just made you that much that much better. Um, when we would go against guys, basically Kansas City had had some very good DBs. Ross was was really good. He played situations a lot. You can tell when the the, the better DBs in the in, in the league back then studied a lot of film um, because they played tendencies. And if they knew what type of offense that you that you ran, they would look at you know where you lined up. Um, if you lined up outside the numbers, you were only going to run this route or that route. If you lined up right on the numbers, you were going to run this route or that route. If you lined up inside, depending if you were in a slot, you in in situation, they knew basically what you were going to run. It's just so it made it a lot harder, man. You had to you actually had to beat those guys back then. Um, um, you know, Dishman was a was a real good corner. He played situations well. He didn't get in your face a lot. He played off, but he played situations really well. He had some good feet. And Dishman was a long guy. He was he was about my size. So going against a DB about my size was a little unheard of back then because you didn't really have a lot of big DBs yeah. uh, like that back back then. Um, the safeties were big. So you you actually had to watch yourself when you were going across the middle because you could get hit and it wasn't a penalty. Um, you know, if you if you were running a crossing route, safeties would look you up. A linebackers would look you up to hit you. And so, you know, it, and it was legal. So, uh, you know, you had to adjust on the fly in a game uh, and, and look out for safeties as, as, as you were coming across the, coming across the field. Um, Dion was, was probably one of the best that I went up against. Uh, you know, I played against him a few times, um, but you can lull him to sleep just a little bit. If you, if you could, if you ran in the middle of the field or ran across the route, Dion wouldn't, he didn't like running through traffic. He liked to be on the outside lined up man to man. And if, and if need be, he followed you, uh, you know, around the field. Um, but, he was a guy who he pressured you a lot. He got in your face, and Dion was was quick. Um, I had my success against him <laughs> for a little bit, but um, you know, those those guys back then, man, they 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 just had a lot more freedom to do things that they, that the DBs now don't have to do. So the DBs now actually have to rely a lot more on their athletic ability yeah, um, because they can't get their hands on on receivers. Um, it's just unfortunate. I, I hate the way the DBs are taught nowadays to play the ball. Um, I've been saying this for years. The best DBs know how to play the ball instead of playing the receiver. Um, they know how to turn and look for the ball because these DBs could have a lot more pass breakups or a lot more interceptions if they just turned and look for the ball. It doesn't take much. It's not when, you, when you're running full speed down, down the field, uh, step for step with a receiver. If you turn your head for the ball the same way the receiver does, you have the same chance of getting the ball the, the, that the receiver does. Absolutely. But these guys don't. They play the, they play the hands, they play the eyes, and they try to just make the make the pass break up uh, when a guy reaches out for the ball. Which is, um, you know, when I was doing my little league coach, and I never taught my DBs to do that. I never taught my son to do that. <laughs> so it's just a little different, man. Those these guys nowadays have to rely on a lot more athletic ability than the guys back in the day.